We started looking this morning at uh, these passages concerning Jesus' uh, youth. We, we looked at his birth last week, and um, these are the events immediately following his birth. They uh, took him to the temple in Jerusalem and made the offering there for a newborn son, and uh, then they went back to their uh, hometown of Nazareth and were warned to flee from there, uh, took Jesus to Egypt for some time to uh, protect him from Herod's plot to uh, kill the Messiah, as, as uh, he no doubt saw the Messiah as a threat to his authority. Uh, and that was the uh, threat that eventually led to Jesus' crucifixion. You remember, uh, it says that they crucified him because of envy. Uh, they were threatened by Jesus. Their authority was uh, under threat. And rather than recognize their rightful place under the authority of the Messiah, the King, as we looked at this morning in the lesson, Worship the King, they tried to eliminate that threat to their authority. But even in that act of trying to eliminate the threat to their authority, they only accomplished the fulfillment of God's plan for Jesus to give his life for our sins and to purchase the church with his own blood. That was what he said to Peter when he asked them, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Peter, uh, in giving the correct answer to that, after uh, saying the various false ideas that men had about Jesus, he said, who do you say that I am? Peter was the one that gave the uh, perfect answer. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said that on that rock, the rock-solid foundation of his deity, that he is the Son of God, he would build his church. Matthew chapter 16, verses 18 and following says, or verses 16 and following says, and he says that the gates of Hades would not prevail against it, meaning that even them taking him and crucifying him, even them putting him to death, would not stop him from building his church, from establishing his kingdom. And so we notice that this morning, that uh, both at his birth, or in connection with the events surrounding his birth, he was referred to as the king of the Jews. The wise men came and said that they were looking for the one who had been born king of the Jews so that they could worship him. And then again at his death, Pilate put that plaque over his head on the cross. Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. We have that statement in the events surrounding his birth, too, when he came back from Egypt. And his parents uh, went back to Nazareth. Matthew says that this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets. It's interesting there that of the, of the five times in the event surrounding the birth of Christ, where Matthew points out that this was the fulfillment of prophecy, this is the only one where he uses the plural prophets. If you look back over at Matthew chapter 1 and verse 22, Matthew says there, So all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord, through the prophet, singular, through the prophet, referring to Isaiah 7, 14. 
And then a little further down in chapter 2, Matthew recording what the chief priests and the scribes answered Herod when he asked uh, where the Christ would be born. And it says in verse 5, Matthew chapter 2 and verse 5, So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, singular. And quoting from Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then the third one in Matthew chapter 2 and verse 15 where it says uh, that they were in Egypt until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, singular, saying, out of Egypt I called my son. And that's the subject of the bulletin article, Hosea chapter 11 and verse 1. And there's some connection there between uh, the way Matthew uses that prophecy from Hosea 11 1 and how he uses this uh, that he would be called a Nazarene. And we'll point that out here in just a minute. Then you drop down to verse 17 to the fourth instance, and he, he says there, Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, see singular, referring to a, a specific prophecy. And quoting from uh, Jeremiah there. Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 15. And then you come down to the fifth one, which is the subject of our lesson this evening. So five times surrounding the birth of Christ, Matthew shows where the events surrounding Jesus' birth was the fulfillment of prophecy. But here in this fifth one, for the first time, he uses the plural, prophets. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. And so the title for this evening's lesson is Jesus the Nazarene. And just like he was called king of the Jews in connection to his birth, and then again in connection with his death, he was called the Nazarene in connection with his birth, and then again the Nazarene, Jesus of Nazareth, on that plaque on the cross. Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. So both of those statements that are made here at his birth were also made at his death on the cross. I think that's very interesting. But where is that prophecy or as he uses the plural here, the prophecies, plural, saying that he would be called a Nazarene? And of course, you know, anytime there's a question like that, uh, the skeptics are going to uh, try to make something of that and say that uh, there's a, a problem with the biblical text because there is no Old Testament prophecy calling him a Nazarene. Well, if you, if you read the bulletin article and you see how he uses Hosea 11.1 1 in connection with, with Christ there and how it's a uh, type, anti-type, uh, fulfillment that, that Matthew is talking about there. Because the, the statement in Hosea 11.1, 1, reading that, you wouldn't even take that to be a Messianic prophecy. But a remembrance of God's care for Israel as he led them out of Egypt, how, how he got them out of Egypt. And, and Hosea uses that statement to refer to the exodus of Israel out of Egypt, not to the birth of, of Christ. And so you look at that and you say, okay, well, is Matthew, is Matthew using a passage out of context? Is he, is he using it incorrectly? And of course, we understand that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Uh, it, it, was, it was given by the Holy Spirit. Matthew wrote what the Holy Spirit gave him to write. So of course not. Of course it's not being used out of context. Of course, it's not being misused or misapplied. So then, how is it being used? And as I pointed out in the bulletin article, it's uh, being used in the way that 
Paul says in Romans chapter 15 and verse 4, whatsoever things were written before were written for our learning, right? Those things that were written in the Old Testament, those were things that were pointing forward to Christ. Uh, again, Paul says, uh, writing to the Corinthians, that the rock that followed Israel in the wilderness, he says that rock was Christ. So the events that transpired with Israel coming out of Egypt and being led through the wilderness, Christ was there, the, the pre-incarnate Christ, the angel of the Lord, the, the uh, 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 presence of Jehovah, the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. The, the miraculous provisions for Israel in the wilderness, that was the second person of the Godhead working with Israel, the eternal Son of God, before he was born in the flesh as Jesus was there in the wilderness with Israel. And so you have all of these types there in the Old Testament that are all pointing forward to Jesus in the New Testament, that are pointing forward to the ultimate fulfillment that Jesus would be to all of those things. You remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the Apostle Paul says that all of those things were examples for us who live under Christ. Well, that's how Matthew is using Hosea 11.1 1 there. So it's not being misapplied, it's not being used out of context, it's not being abused in any way. It is that type and anti-type application of Old Testament prophecy. And so with that understanding, we come over here to the Nazarene, and we say, okay, well, what is this talking about? Jesus the Nazarene, that it might... Uh, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, and that's, that's a key there, that's significant, to, by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. Okay, well, how am I to take that when I can't find anything in the Old Testament that specifically says or explicitly says that the Messiah would be from Nazareth? As a matter of fact, Nazareth isn't even mentioned in the Old Testament. So how am I to understand that? Is... is Matthew talking about prophecies that were spoken and not written down? Because, you know, we, we do read about prophets in the Old Testament that didn't write anything. We know that there were prophets among the people who were telling the people the, the, the word of God that didn't get written down, right? God had written down what we need for the scheme of redemption, to see the scheme of redemption and to, to have the salvation of our souls. God had written down, all the way from Genesis to Revelation, what is written in Scripture is so that we could hear the Word of God and believe what it teaches about Christ and His kingdom, and believing that to repent of our sins and confess that we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, so that making that confession with the mouth unto salvation, we could be baptized into Christ, to be united with Him in baptism, so that His death would pay the price for our sins, and we could live in newness of life with Him. That's why what is recorded is recorded, so that we could do that. So that we have the, all the information here. There's nothing lacking here to be the man that God wants us to be, to be the person that can live a life well-pleasing to God. That's what Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All Scripture is given by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly furnished for every good work. And so that's what we have in Scripture. So we understand that the prophets were preaching things. The prophets were, were telling the people things that we don't have written down. Isn't that what John said? That if, if we had everything written down, the world couldn't contain that book. All the things that, that would need to be written down about Jesus. The world couldn't contain that book. So we know, we, we, don't, we don't have an exhaustive source of information about everything all the prophets ever said, right? We only read just little pieces of what uh, 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 Nathan said to David, or what, what Gad said, or what, what uh, 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 the Old Testament prophets had to say. We just read little pieces. Elijah and Elisha and the others, the schools of the prophets. You know, there's a whole lot back there that we don't have written down. So some have said, well, Matthew, by inspiration, is referring to things that the prophets said about the Messiah, 
That's not written down. That's not it. Don't, don't write that down as the answer to that verse because that's not it. <laughs> because that, that would be contrary to Matthew's point. In all these passages, as you go through Matthew, of all these passages saying uh, that it might be fulfilled, right? Because Matthew was proving Jesus to be the fulfillment of the Messianic prophecies to the Jews who knew those prophecies. So what would be the point of citing prophecies that people didn't have, that people didn't know? So that's not the answer. That's a speculation that some have made to explain why there's not a prophecy in the Old Testament that says he would be called a Nazarene, but that's not the right answer. The right answer is that Matthew is using the word Nazarene as kind of a play on words in one way or another. There's two possibilities for the way that Matthew is using the word Nazarene. Uh, and I'll tell you that I think it's, I'm going to tell you the one I don't think it is first. It's possible, but it's, I don't think it's the right one, and I'll tell you why. Uh, I think it's the, the second one I'm going to tell you is, is the right answer. Uh, but that being said, take which one you want, either one, you can take it either way, uh, or both. I mean, make, mash them together and have both of them, you're still okay. <laughs> But it's not that Matthew was, was referring to prophecies that weren't written down. The, the word Nazareth here is very similar uh, in the consonants of the word to the Hebrew word you find in Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 1. And a lot of people have made the connection, and, and I think justifiably, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with making this connection, I'm going to tell you why I don't think it's the correct answer in just a minute, but I don't think there's anything wrong with making this connection. When you go back to Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 1, the word branch in Hebrew is uh, nezer. And so it's, it, it looks very similar to the word Nazareth. And so people have looked at the similarity between those words and, and they say, well, Matthew is making that connection to Jesus as the branch. Hebrews cha or, uh, Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 1 is one of several of the branch passages, as they're referred to, about Jesus. And he says, there shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse. Jesse was David's father, so we're talking about the Messiah being the seed of David. Jesus fulfilled that. Jesus was the seed of David. Right? We've got both genealogies there of his, of his adoptive father, Joseph, and his biological mother, Mary, and they both go back to David. So he fulfilled that stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. That word branch, again, is Nezer, which is very similar to the word Nazareth, in the consonants, when you look at the when you look at the words, you, you ever see those little word puzzles where they uh, leave all the vowels out of the words, and when you just when you first look at it at a glance, you don't even notice that the vowels aren't there, right? And you just read through it, and then at the at the at the bottom, it'll say something like, you know, you just read this whole thing with no with no vowels, right? And then you look at it more closely, and you say, oh, look at that, there's no vowels in any of those words, but you can still read it because. Your, the way your brain works is when you see something familiar, your brain kind of sees it the way that you expect to see it, right? That's, you hear sometimes, you see what you expect to see, right? That's why, you know, people can kind of be sneaky and get, get by without you seeing them because they're doing something that you don't expect to see someone doing, so you don't notice it. Uh, well, that's kind of how, how those words work, right? If, if you were just to... To look at the word Nezer, and you were, you were expecting Nazareth, you would see Nazareth, right? Or vice versa. So some say, well, that, that's what Matthew's doing here. And it's possible. I don't think it's the right answer, but it's possible. And the reason I don't think it's the right answer goes back to the plural prophets. Because Isaiah is the only one that uses that word for branch. In all the other branch passages, it's a different word for branch. Only Isaiah uses the word Nezer for branch. Now, they mean the same thing, but they're not spelled the same way. So you wouldn't look at those other words and say, oh, that's, that's, you know, that looks like Nazareth. You wouldn't do that. So 
why would he say prophets instead of prophet like he did the other four times when only one prophet used the word that way? There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. I'm just going to run through the uh, branch passages because we need to learn those about Jesus. They're, They're messianic prophecies about Jesus, and they say something about who and what he was. Jeremiah 23, verses 5 and 6. Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6 says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. Again, the word branch there is not netzer. It's not the same Hebrew word. So it doesn't qualify for plural prophets. Uh, A branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper. So the branch of David... The the one who would fulfill the prophecy of of coming as the seed of David to sit on his throne would be a king of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. Now this is his name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness. Isn't that a beautiful prophecy about Christ? The Lord our righteousness. Isn't that what Paul says about Jesus? That he is the righteousness of God, and in him we are the righteousness of God. Right? As Paul said in Romans chapter uh, 1, verses 16 and 17, uh, that the gospel is God's power unto salvation, and in it, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. Well, what is the gospel? The word gospel means good news. Good news about what? Good news about the Lord, our righteousness. We become righteous when we live like Jesus, the Lord, our righteousness. Jeremiah chapter 33, verses 15 and 16. Jeremiah 33, verses 15 and 16. (laughs) says, in those days and at that time, I will cause to grow up to David a branch. Again, not Netzer. <laughs> that word's only used in Isaiah 11.1. 1. I will cause to grow up to David a branch of righteousness. He shall execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell safely. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord our righteousness. The Lord our righteousness. Zechariah chapter 3 and verse 8. You heard me say this morning in looking at some passages from Zechariah that that Zechariah's messianic prophecies are probably my favorite. I know Isaiah has some amazingly beautiful messianic prophecies. Isaiah is referred to as the messianic prophet because he, he gives so much information about the Messiah. And, and, and I love those Messianic prophecies from Isaiah. They're beautiful. But I really like Zechariah's Messianic prophecies. In Zechariah chapter 3 and verse 8, he says, Hear, O Joshua, the high priest, you and your companions who sit before you, for they are a wondrous sign. For behold, I am bringing forth my servant, the branch. That is, the branch of David, the seed of David. Zechariah chapter 6, verses 12 and 13. In Zechariah chapter 6, beginning with verse 12, Zechariah says, Then speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch. From his place he shall branch out, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Yes, He shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule on his throne. So he shall be a priest on his throne. And the council of peace shall be between them both. That was one of them that we looked at this morning. But we didn't look at that part that says whose name is the branch. He is the one who came to be the ultimate fulfillment of that promise that God made to David that he would always have a seed on his throne, and Christ reigns forever 
on the throne of David, that symbolic seat of authority over God's people. We today, the church, is the Israel of God. Today, read Romans chapter 2. Today, the Jew is the one who is a Jew inwardly, not the one who is one outwardly. It's a spiritual condition, not a condition based on physical genealogy. So the king of the Jews is still the king of the Jews. Spiritual Jews, spiritual Israel, the church. He is the ultimate fulfillment of the seed of David. And we get over to the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 5 and verse 5, it says there, But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. I, I, I love that reference to Jesus. The lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And then at the, the end of Revelation in chapter 22 and verse 16, it says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. What led the wise men to where Jesus was? That star. Jesus is that bright and morning star, that guiding light that guides us where we need to be, that guides us where we need to go to find everlasting life. So some have said that Matthew is referring to these branch passages by making a play on words with that Hebrew word netzer. Again, I don't think that's the right answer because only Isaiah uses that. So it wouldn't be plural prophets. It would be singular prophet, the prophet Isaiah, using that word netzer. But then when you look at the perception of Nazareth in the time of Christ, and, and what was it Nathaniel said when uh, they came and told him that they had found the Christ, Jesus of Nazareth? And, and what did Nathaniel say? Does anything good come out of Nazareth? Right? That's, that's how the people at that time perceived Nazareth. It was to, to call someone a Nazarene in that time would be like calling somebody a, a hillbilly or a bumpkin, uh, uh, a a belittling term. That's, that's how they use the word Nazarene. Right? If somebody was, if somebody was being a, 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 a bumpkin, a simpleton, they might, they might say, well, he's being like a Nazarene. Right? So, when you, when you see that perception of, of Nazareth, and, and how they used the term Nazarene as kind of a slur, then you see where Matthew could say, as was spoken by the prophets, plural. Because there are several references, all the way from David, who was a prophet, to Isaiah, to uh, uh, Daniel, of the Messiah being lowly, poor, uh, uh, not someone who was respected or, or exalted because of, his, uh, because of his stature, but rather people would exalt Christ because of his words, because of what he taught, not, not because he came from the royal family or, or he was born in a palace. No, he, he was despised. By those in high offices. All the way back in Psalm 22. Beginning with verse 6. Psalm 22 is amazing. Because it, it so clearly pictures the crucifixion. A thousand years before it happened. And uh, it, it, it's, it's one of the clearest examples. Of the miraculous origin of scripture that you can find. And in Psalm 22, beginning with verse 6, it says, But I am a worm. Now this, this is depicting the Messiah speaking about himself. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men, 
and despised by the people. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, He trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. And so, David, a thousand years before the fulfillment of his seed promise would come to pass, was shown so clearly how he would be reviled and despised by men. In Isaiah chapter 49 and verse 7, I said, okay, so now we're into prophets, right? Not prophet, <laughs> right? Now we were up to two, uh, David and, and Isaiah. And there's many more examples we could find other than what I'm quoting here. But in Isaiah chapter 49 and verse 7, Isaiah says there, Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, their Holy One, to him whom man, what? Despises. He was despised. He was a Nazarene in, in their minds. He was someone that they would call a Nazarene. Whom man despises. To him whom the nation abhors. That's some strong language right there. To the servant of rulers, kings shall see and arise, princes also shall worship, because the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, and he has chosen you. So where man despises him, God chose him, God exalted him. He was the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And of course, Isaiah chapter 53 and how Isaiah pictures the suffering servant, the Messiah, as the suffering servant. As he says there, Isaiah chapter 53, beginning verse 1. Who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Drop down to verse 5, Isaiah 53 and verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. Drop down to verse 8, Isaiah 53 and verse 8. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. And so Isaiah pictures him as the despised, reviled, suffering servant. As a, a Nazarene. In Daniel chapter 9 and verse 26, you've got uh, these uh, 70 weeks that Daniel's talking about. We're going to talk about Daniel's 70 weeks in the Thursday morning Bible class uh, pretty soon. <laughs> Not immediately, but pretty soon. And, and in that uh, context, Daniel chapter 9 and verse 26, it says, And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. No, he was cut off for us. He was crucified for us. So that we could have everlasting life in him. Messiah shall be cut off. But not for himself. And the people of the prince. Who is to come. Shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. That's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. The end of it shall be with a flood. Until the end of the war. Desolations are determined. That's the desolation of abomination. That Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24. To look out for these, these armies surrounding Jerusalem. But notice what it says about Messiah before that would happen. Messiah shall be cut off. He was reviled. He was despised. He was, he was killed by his own people. Remember what John said in his prologue? He came to his own and his own received him not. They despised him. Now, in, in my opinion, that's what Matthew's talking about when he says... That him uh, coming out of Nazareth, him, him 
coming back from Egypt to Nazareth and growing up in Nazareth. And so when he, when he comes out and begins his ministry, he is someone coming out of Nazareth. So that uh, Nathaniel would say, does anything good come out of Nazareth? Because he wasn't going to be like a king from a palace coming out in his pomp and pageantry. But rather he was going to be the suffering servant that would give his life for the sins of the world that came out of a reviled city in Judea, came out of a, uh, a, a city that was uh, referred to as, as uh, uh, a, a, a area for Gentiles. Isn't it interesting that he's referred to as coming out of Galilee of the Gentiles? And he is the light to the Gentiles. He's the king of king and king of kings and lord of lords. As we were referred to this morning. The king that is to be worshipped and praised and honored. He is Jesus the Nazarene. Do you need to come to him this evening while we stand and sing?